Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin. I'm very grateful for your tuning in and joining me here for preaching the gospel. Perhaps you're at home today and you have the opportunity to take your Bible down and follow along with me. We would love and appreciate that. Maybe you're joining us on a break at work. And if that's the case, then we are certainly glad that you have carved out this time during your day in which to be with us and to apply yourself to a study of God's Word. We understand that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path, as the psalmist tells us in Psalm 119, verse 105. And thus we are in great need, obvious need of the guidance and the instruction of God's Word, and we are grateful to have it, so thankful for the Bible, and we're thankful now for this opportunity to study it together. I've today chosen a thought that comes to us from the book of Luke. We're not going to spend all of our time in the gospel according to Luke, but we are going to begin there by pointing out something that we find in two consecutive chapters of this gospel account. And so if you won't, be opening your Bible first to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and in a moment, we'll be starting in this place. Our title for today simply would be The Power of Memory. The Power of Memory. Have you ever thought very much about the faculties with which God has endowed us as mankind? Uh, There are so many faculties with which we are blessed. You might think particularly, for example, about the faculty of reason, the ability that man has to be able to observe or or draw, uh, draw from his environment, observing data, facts, and then to relate those facts one to another, and then ultimately to reason analyze, and draw a conclusion. You know, that's a great faculty. That's a great blessing that God has given mankind. And yet then also there's the faculty known as memory. Memory, the fact that we can remember past events, uh, recall those, as it were, in our minds, and and then uh, act accordingly. Maybe there had been something that we had forgotten or something that we had overlooked for a span. And then upon remembering that, or that being brought to our attention once more, we alter our course of action. We do something differently. Again, a great blessing there in memory. Well, that's the one today that I would like for us to elaborate concerning. Let's think about the power of memory. Now, we begin in Luke chapter 16, the account involving the rich man and Lazarus. And this is a very familiar account found in Luke's gospel narrative. Uh, Both the rich man and Lazarus, they die, and yet their fortunes, and I'm using that term very loosely, following death are completely different. And if you're familiar at all, you know this. Notice verse 22 And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, now notice this, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now, this is a most sobering reading uh, from the standpoint that we realize apparently on the other side of death, when we have left the walks of this world, 
that we will retain, at least to an extent, we will retain our faculty known as memory. Now think about how serious that is. Abraham instructed the rich man, son, remember. Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. How haunting that must have been for the rich man to, to, to remember his life back here in the earthly realm, to remember all of the pleasures and all of the comforts and all of the conveniences that he enjoyed, only now to find himself in a place of torment. Now think about that as, as we consider our own mortality, the fact that you and I, all of us one day, will die, leaving this earthly realm, unless, of course, Jesus returns first. But following death, the retention of our memory, that, that, that is something that is sobering for us to consider because as we remember our lives here upon earth, what we are forced to ask ourselves is, will that memory be a source of resentment and regret, as it were? Or, or will it be a, a source of gratitude and, and thankfulness and celebration, so to speak? Something we need to think about, something we need to consider. And so in Luke chapter 16, we see that there is an indication that on the other side of death, we will retain the faculty of memory. Now, let's back up one chapter earlier to Luke chapter 15. And in Luke chapter 15, uh, we come to the parable of the prodigal son. And, and again, these are probably the two of the most familiar chapters, not only in Luke's gospel account, but perhaps uh, out of all of the gospel accounts, Luke 15 and Luke 16 are probably two of the most familiar texts. And in this one, when we read about the prodigal son, verses 11 through 32, we realize that memory also factors in to this portion uh, of the gospel account. Uh, we know that the prodigal son went into a far country, uh, verse 13, there he wasted his substance with riotous, not righteous, mind you, but riotous living. And then verse 14, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And notice verse 17, and when he came to himself, well, what constituted that? That mental activity of coming to himself. You know, previously he had been telling himself lies. At this point in verse 17, the young man finally once more begins telling himself truth. He came to himself. Well, that involved memory. He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He remembered home. He remembered the status and the condition in which even the hired servants lived back at his home. And now in his memory, he's contrasting their state with the pitiable and the lamentable state of himself presently. And it's really heart-wrenching. You know, it must have pricked him to the heart to realize that his poor decisions had landed him in a state that was far worse than the mere servants, the hired servants uh, back at home. And so, once again, memory comes to the fore, if you will, and we see the power of memory in our lives. Now, what's good about this parable, Luke 15, is that memory can be a powerful and helpful faculty while we still remain on this earth. While 
we still have time and opportunity to repent before God, to amend our ways, and to submit to the Lord in obedience. And so that's really where I want us to spend the, the balance of our time here today. As we talk about the power of memory, I want us to do so from the standpoint of while we yet live upon this earth, while there is still time and opportunity for us to change our ways, to repent before God as needed, and to submit to His will in all things, how can memory help us to do that very thing or those very things? And so let, let's discuss a few things. Number one, particularly for the erring child of God, let's say that you have a man or a woman who had obeyed the gospel. They were members of Christ's church. They had been added to the church by the Lord himself in their obedience to the gospel. But now they've become backslidden, apostate. They've gone back into the ways of the world. Number one, they need to remember the blessings of home. Remember the blessings of home. And when I speak of home in this connection, obviously, I'm talking about home in the church, home in the body of Christ. You know, Jesus taught in John 10 and verse 10, he said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Our Lord came on his soul-saving mission, his redemptive mission. Jesus came in order to give us a better quality of life. Now, not necessarily socially, even though the gospel does impact society, and not even necessarily economically or financially, even though if we follow biblical principles, there will be blessings connected therewith. But what Jesus came to give us was the abundant life spiritually. And we need to appreciate that so much of that is involved uh, today, of course, in our connection with his body, the church. In the New Testament, we read that the spiritual body of Christ is his church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Those souls who obey the gospel being baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins Acts 2, 38, they are added to that church, Acts 2 and verse 47, uh, known collectively as the churches of Christ, Romans 16 and verse 16. Now, as members of that body, there is so much blessedness, the blessings of spiritual home, if you will. And whenever a child of God wavers, whenever he or she wanders off back into the world or into religious error, they would do well to remember the blessings of home. Let's look at a couple of New Testament texts that would just uh, characterize or exemplify for us, at least in some ways, the blessings of being in Christ's church as a faithful member. Let's go first of all to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and there, there's really so much in this entire chapter that might be applicable to this present consideration, but let's begin at verse 14. 1 Corinthians 12, 14, Paul said, For the body is not one member, but many. And that makes sense. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Paul says, well, is it therefore not of the body? Of course not. Even though the foot has a very different function from that of the hand, the foot is just as much a part of the body as is the hand. And he illustrates further, verse 16. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Well, of course not. Of course it is of the body. If the whole body were an eye, verse 17, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? 
Verse 18, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Now, you know as well as I that the Holy Spirit's point in the writings of the Apostle Paul here was not regarding anatomy. <laughs> that, that, that's not the point. Uh, we're reading about feet and hands, eyes and ears, and, and even by allusion, we're reading about the nose. But this is not an anatomy lesson. There's a spiritual application here, and it's found in verse 18. God hath set the members, every member, every Christian, every child of God, in the body as it hath pleased him. And so as we remember the blessings of spiritual home, that is, the church, we need to remember the church as a place where every member has a role. Every child of God is important. It, it doesn't matter about age, <clears throat> whether young or old. It doesn't matter about socioeconomic background, wh whether rich or poor. It doesn't matter about educational level. Uh, some, some maybe do not even have a high school education. Others may have terminal degrees. But none of that matters when it comes to one's importance one's usefulness in the body, in the church. And so how wonderful it was to have been part of the family of God in which every member matters. Now, those who are away from the church, they're away from Christ, they need to remember that. They, they need to remember what that was like, being a part of the body. Now, hopefully, hopefully, and this is... Um, sobering to think about, but hopefully they were part of a congregation in which this attitude was practiced. It was exemplified. You know, if not, then they're, they're going to be lacking a great tool in, in hopes of bringing them back. You know, if, if their memory of the church is not matching up with what we read here in 1 Corinthians 12, that's not good. And so they're going to be bereft of something that otherwise could prove to be very powerful in reminding them and even persuading them of the need to come back home, the power of memory. Uh, move down with us to verse 25, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25. Uh, this is brought out in a different way, that there should be no schism in the body, no no fracture, no division in the body, but, but, but that the members should have the same care one for another. So much so that in verse 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And then Paul adds verse 27, now ye, or you all, all of you, are the body of Christ and members in particular. We need to remember the blessings of home. The church of Christ is to be a body of believers in which all members have the same care one for another. Verse 25. When one weeps, we all weep together, verse 26. When one is honored, we all rejoice together. Now, I don't know. Our viewing audience, I'm sure, is, very, is varied. But perhaps you're tuned in or logged on today, and, and you yourself at one time were a member of Christ's church, but you're away. You know, maybe it's been quite a while since you worshiped regularly with God's people and, and since you personally were walking in the light of his word. Can you remember home? Can you remember the blessings of being in the body, the church of Christ? And, and as you remember those blessings, are you not prompted? Are you not urged to come back home? We need to be. We need to remember the blessings of home. But not only that, number two, my memory can be quite powerful in bringing us back home in that we need to remember the way home. 
not just the blessings that are found at home, but we need to remember the way back, the way back to where I once was in faithful service to the Lord. I know the way back. Now, I dare say that that most all of us, if if we have ever wandered away, that we, deep down inside, we remembered the way back. We knew that through repentance, that is, a change of our hearts, and confession, simply acknowledging that, that I've sinned, I, I did wrong, and I, I left the Lord. And then through prayer, both our own prayer and even the prayers of, of others, brothers and sisters, we, we understand that we could be restored, that we could come back home. Well, look with me a little further or a little more deeply concerning this. Let's go to the book of Revelation. It's interesting to me that at least twice in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, as our Lord was giving essentially what are these many epistles to the congregations in Asia, two different times Jesus urged his people to remember. Look at this, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, beginning, Jesus said to those in Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou Repent. Now, there were some good things about the Church of Christ in ancient Ephesus. You can read about those in verses 2 and 3. But in verse 4, Jesus had to say, I have somewhat against thee. There, there is a problem. You have left your first love. Verse 5, his prescription was, Remember. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and do the first works. If I I were to paraphrase that, remember how you used to live. Or maybe based on verse 4, remember how you used to love. You've left your first love. Remember the first works. Remember your zeal and diligence and obedience when you first had obeyed my gospel. Remember, you know the way Back. You, you know how it was. You know now how it is. You know the way back. That's the first occurrence here in the letter to the church at Ephesus. But then move down with me into chapter 3. And in chapter 3 now, Jesus is addressing in verses 1 through 6, he's addressing the church of Christ in ancient Sardis. And again, notice verses 2 and 3 be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect or full grown before God. And so, verse 3, remember. Remember, therefore, how that thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Here it seems that Jesus was telling or commanding this congregation to remember what you were taught. Remember thou for, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. In essence, remember what you were taught, what you initially obeyed, and he says, hold fast, get back to that, and repent. Change your heart. Change your mind once again. If therefore thou shalt not watch, Jesus says, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. In other words, there will be judgment. There will be judgment if you don't remember what you've received, what you've heard, and you get back to that. Think how simple that is, and yet at the same time, how powerful. When a child of God wanders away, essentially what has happened is he or she has forgotten the teachings that at one time they embraced. At one time they honored and they obeyed these teachings of the Bible, but they have forgotten those things. And so Jesus says, remember. 
Get back to what you were taught. Get back to following my word. Now, there's a passage in the Psalms that comes to my mind here at this juncture. It's found in the longest chapter. You'll immediately perhaps recognize that as Psalm 119. And in verses 59 and 60, notice what the psalmist said there in connection with these matters we've been discussing. Verse 59, the psalmist wrote, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. You know, that's really what's required of all of us if or when we wander away from faithfulness before the Lord. We need to pause and we need to think on our ways. And upon thinking on our ways, we should immediately recognize, hey, there's a problem. (laughs) You know, I once did this. I once was living like that. But now I'm doing differently. Now I'm living differently. And so I think on my ways. And upon doing that, hopefully the reaction will be, I turn my feet once more unto thy testimonies. In other words, I now have the intent, I want to go back. When you turn your feet, you're altering your course. You're altering the direction in which you were headed. And so now the psalmist says, I'm turning my feet back to your word. I'm heading back to doing what your word instructs me to do. And then in verse 60, he says, I did this with haste. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Now, if we were to think back to the prodigal son with whom we dealt a moment ago in Luke chapter 15, it it seems as we read that text that we are impressed with haste also in that reading. You know, one day he's in the pig pen of life, so to speak, and he's so hungry that he would eat what the hogs are eating, if only he could. And that's when he came to himself. And he remembered the blessings of home, yes. He remembered the security and the comforts of home. And then everything seems to move pretty rapidly. It seems that he then decides that I'm going to arise and I'm going back to my father and I'm going to confess my sins and and, and I'm going to tell him that I'll be a hired servant. Just let me be at home. And apparently he moved without delay. Friends, we're so thankful that that you've joined us today, but you know, for those of you in our viewing audience especially, if you're away from home spiritually, away from Christ's church and faithful service to him, let the power of memory serve to help bring you back, bring you back home. Thank you.